This is the Digital Formula Podcast, a show about digital transformations, why they fail and how you can apply the formula to ensure that your transformation program will create the expected results by aligning your services to your strategy, architect solutions well, and deliver them in an agile fashion. Hey Mike, how you doing? Good, Roland. Good to be back. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm repeating myself. It's always like, oh, we should do this more often. So, Mike, maybe we do this more often, you know? I think we um, are. We got a, I hope we got so. a, new, a new guest today, too. That is true. That is true. And and I cannot pronounce his name correctly, so I don't know if if Craig or Greg is the right pronunciation, but give me a slack, please, you know. Um, but we have our local ITSM uh, resident expert, uh, in the call. Greg, welcome to the show. Hello. Yeah, usually people don't have trouble with my first name. Craig is not the harder one. It's my last name, which is pronounced Barbaco, although rarely do people get that right. They usually say Barbacow based on the spelling. <laughs> or I'm Oh, sure I would have said Barbakov, but Bar okay. Bar yeah, I get Barbakov, especially from my Russian friends, and uh, you get uh, Barbecue for those people who are a fan of you know, <laughs> products. So I, I answer to well, all those things. You, you, li you live in North Carolina, so barbecue is a thing. In, I do heard, live in North you know? Carolina, yes. Yeah, we, do we have don't want to go here. down. Yeah, we don't go down that route. But um, in all seriousness, what we're going to talk today about with Craig is um, about a thing that I think most organizations don't really get right, which is DevOps. Um, so the combination of development and operations, and this is where basically my knowledge about this topic almost ends. Uh, so I'm happy that we have you on the show. Um, but before we get started with that, Greg, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what you've done and maybe also something about you as a person, you know, what your bucket list yeah. items are and, and how you mean Western North Carolina barbecue tastes? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm not sure how far back you want me to go. I, I was born at a very young age back in prehistoric times. Um, now, I actually, I had a kind of an unusual career in IT, I would say, and I won't bore you with all the details, but to give you an idea, in college, I studied political science with a focus on international relations, which you can see there's not any obvious connection between that. And anything oh, it's very helpful in IT. Yeah, I found it very, very useful. And then uh, I my career started off not in IT at all, uh, basically in like the retail sector, um, and then I saw this thing happening it was called like the internet. This is, I'm dating myself. You can see for those people who are not watching or just listening, I do have quite a bit of white and gray in my beard. Um, so there was this emerging thing called the internet and I thought that was kind of cool. So I decided to go to grad school and I got a, an MBA and a master's in information management, which is basically a computer science degree. And so I kind of got into uh, IT about 20 years ago. I worked for uh, IBM for about 10 years, uh, starting off in their strategy and architecture practice. So that's kind of my, my roots is IT strategy and, and architecture and process engineering. Then I worked with IBM Software Group. I lived in Australia for three years in their software group. And that's where I got into the software development side of the house. And then without you know, boring me with my whole, my whole career, I've just bounced around a bit. I worked at some of the big four firms and done some boutique consulting firms and some freelance and pretty much Almost anything you could think of in IT, I've done it. I've got a, for those who care about things like that, I've got a bunch of certifications. I'm a ServiceNow guy. I'll admit that, you know, I've got a lot of ServiceNow certifications. I'm an ITIL guy for people who remember what that is. An Agile person, I've got a lot of Agile certifications and also dabbled here in like Lean Six Sigma and human centered design and organizational change. So I've kind of, uh, I'm like say maybe a jack of all trades, but I sort of specialize in IT service management. Though so that's the thing that, like I said, that's what I'm known for, I suppose. Yeah, and and I guess the the big four background seems to be a pattern in in our organization here as well. So uh, even though you had the wrong colors, but we don't want to go too down, too much deep down that rabbit hole. Um, but maybe maybe talk a little bit about you as a person before we go to the actual topic of the show today. Yeah, well, I know you and I will have. A little bit in common we're both uh pet people and camping people so you know i've i've got a rv I actually got an airstream roll and i both have airstreams and we hook Me it too. up to our, yeah we hook up to our trucks <laughs> and i throw my three dogs and two cats and my wife she she also comes along too. We, we go camping as often <laughs> as we can you know <laughs> so. please note the sequence and and by the way Gigi, don't kill us you know when you listen to this 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was in no particular order, you know. Uh, <laughs> there's no. My wife doesn't. She's not the one being thrown in there. She, you know, she's generally sits in the passenger seat or the driver's seat, and then we you, you load, cannot gently load the animal into the, uh, the truck. Yeah. Anyway, so we like like camping, and um, also I'm a a sci-fi nerd. I you know proudly admit to being a sci-fi nerd, and I like pretty much all of it. You know, Star Trek, Star Wars, Dune. You you, you name it, I, I probably like it. And I think that's kind of my love of IT, where that really started. You know, I mean, when I was a kid, I had you know dating myself at an Atari 500, learned like programming on Basic, not Visual Basic, but Basic. <laughs> but I think my the influence of sci-fi. It's one of those things, especially like on Star Trek, where the engineers save the day, and I was kind of like that. Computer stuff is cool, and mm-hmm. you know, future mm-hmm. thinking and I think that probably led me into my technology career. Well, that's another thing that we share. You know, I remember Mike having the Battlestar Galactica sticker on his phone <laughs> way back when. I don't know if that's still a thing. And I, I'm I'm enjoying Star Trek. So uh, I, I think this I is the Battle right Star crew today. I'm a huge Battlestar. <laughs> the original one, the one from, I think, 1979. The 70s, yeah. Yeah, it was long The 2000 green. version, yeah. I think they're both. Yeah, that's pretty vintage, for different that's, reasons. That's uh, <laughs> really vintage. Yeah. But I like the old Star Trek too, so. All right. So with that being being clarified, Greg, I'd like to go into actually the, the, the meat of the, the show. Um, let's start with some definitions. You know, I'm pretty sure everybody has heard the, I don't know if it's a word, the term DevOps, but I'm not sure if everybody really understands what that actually means. Uh, can you give us a little bit of insight in into this concept and, and uh, you know, where it came from and how old it is and, and all that type of stuff? Yeah, yeah. Um, let me start by saying what DevOps is not. Mm, mm. <laughs> and to answer your question about kind of the history of it, uh, for those people who are kind of in the IT world, uh, I affectionately refer to as like the IT shop in an organization. Uh, traditionally, and I think it's still true today in most organizations, you have at least two different parts of the IT organization. You've got people that are like developers, <clears throat> which is often referred to as like, you know, development, like the the dev, the dev part of the organization. And, and, and we all like, remember, we all remember Steve Palmer, developers, developers, developers. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> you know, and they, I think we all kind of conjure an image of what developers are like. You know, it's a bunch of guys with bottles of Mountain Dew and, you know, Domino's pizza stacked up, you know, programming all night long, you know, Silicon Valley, that, that yeah, kind of white, thing. White Sox and Birkenstocks, yes, yes. Yep, yep, exactly. And then there's the other side of the house, which is like the operations, which often overlaps with, say, infrastructure, which mm-hmm. I think a lot of people kind of think of the boring side. You know, it's not the exciting thing where you're coding cool features and functions. You're just kind of keeping the lights on. So like data center operations and monitoring and network and, you know, servers and capacity management and things like that. And very often these two organizations, dev and ops, they use different tools, they have different processes, they have different cultures, uh, different terminology, they often don't play nice with each other, they don't really work all that cooperatively, and there's this idea of like developers develop stuff like on their laptops, and they throw it over the wall to the operations guys and go, go make this work on, you know, servers in the data center. If it doesn't work, well, that's your problem, you go figure it out. So there's often an not hopefully not too much, but there can be an adversarial relationship between these two. So DevOps is this idea of you marry the two functions together that Mm -hmm. developers and operations folks work collaboratively and they have shared responsibility. And this entails some organizational changes, how you structure your teams, the skills you need, the tools you have, your culture, your governance. So DevOps is a fairly complex topic. Most people focus on the tools part. They talk about the DevOps tool chain. So they start saying things like Jenkins and Kubernetes and Azure DevOps. And they say things like uh, CI, CD pipelines, and they start getting to a lot of like techie stuff. But DevOps mm-hmm. is actually more than that. It is the the culture, the organization, the process, and the tools are also very, very important. Yeah. And that's, that's also a nice picture. Actually, you gave me the option of three pictures that I would put on the side while you were talking. And I have to choose between the, the nice infinity symbol, you know, yeah. of, uh, oh yeah, it's a process up to a, a graphic yeah, that has like, I don't know, a hundred, 150 different tools on it, you know? Yeah. Well, let me mention, so I, I didn't say this in my description. I kind of said what it's not, and I gave you a very high level description of DevOps, but you mentioned that infinity symbol, which is like this continuous development release cycle. Um, 
so that that's a really big part of it is like so why and why would you do devops like why has it become popular and the idea was that the more traditional ways that we were describing were this development side of the house and the infrastructure and operations side of the house can often be kind of slow and inefficient and so you, you have these situations especially in the old days before cloud computing where the developers say we got this new cool feature and function let's load a server and by the time they procure the server and they put it in the the data center and they rack it and stack it and connect power and cabling and all that kind of stuff and they load the operating system it could be months later before you can even mm-hmm. put up the the new uh, application even in the development environment much less get into production but with DevOps with these new cloud computing and advanced tools, you, know, you can provision new infrastructure within minutes off of something like Google or AWS or Azure or whoever your cloud provider is of choice. And the developers can often release multiple times a day so that you can develop you know, new features and functions, sometimes micro features and functions, sometimes really big, huge releases. And you can get those out into production to your customers continuously in a continuous pipeline. And so from a business perspective, the ability to get to market faster than your competitors and continually iterate and continually improve is a huge strategic advantage to those who are not in the DevOps world. So I, I get the I get the, the faster, but that still sounds a lot like what IT and IT services did in the past, you know, that with frameworks like ITIL and, and all those other things in there. Is that is that just ITIL on steroids? Is it just faster or is it is it something completely I, different? I, I like this question. It's a really good question. So uh, I'll tell you that I think if you ask 10 people that question, you'll get at least 11 different answers. Um, I think most people would tell you that the things you refer to, ITIL, which maybe people don't know what that is, that's, that's kind of like your de facto standard for IT service management frameworks, best practices, and things like that. So even the concept of IT service management and ITIL, people would say, that's what the old guys do. That's very traditional. That's outdated. You know, that's that's kind of in modern context, essentially garbage. We need to steer away from that. And many people, many organizations have had bad experiences where they did an ITIL transformation or some sort of IT service management mm-hmm. uh, implementation of some sort, they put in IT service management tools like ServiceNow or some other type of technology like that and found it to be highly bureaucratic and slow and inefficient. So a lot of people will tell you that DevOps is like a paradigm shift. It's a totally different thing and it's incompatible. Um, And I understand why people say that. I mean, I don't think they're entirely wrong in that. Um, But my perspective is a bit different having started with ITIL and IT service management, you know, It back in ancient times, you know, I was there <laughs> when some of this stuff was being invented and seeing the evolution working on software teams as you know, agile became more common, things like Scrum and Kanban and scaled agile framework, like safe and seeing these DevOps tools develop. I feel like DevOps is more of an evolution of IT service management. And a lot of the foundational concepts in DevOps are uh, what they've been talking about in the IT service management, ITSM world for a long time. And what I'd say is that in the past, there was a lot of limitations on the technology. There was just things just were slower and harder to do. And now in the world of AI and cloud computing and all these cool DevOps tool chain things, there's stuff that you can do much, much faster. And there's just some people haven't caught up. They're still doing things in the old way and not embracing the new technology. So to me, DevOps, like I said, it's a, it is a, a shift, but it's an evolution from a cultural perspective, an organizational perspective, a skills perspective, and also a technology perspective. I would say, uh, so I would say, Craig, that the, the, probably one of the things you mentioned in terms of actually making DevOps work is a lot harder to do than the, some of the others. And you yes. probably already keyed in on this, going to go with the word culture. And, and when we talk about DevOps and making it work in terms of delivering that value, um, the, the, one of the biggest challenges I've seen, and I want to hear your view on this, And Scaled Agile talks about, just regular Agile, forget the Scaled, talks about this all the time. From a cultural perspective, how do you get people to really think about both the development folks and the operations folks to think about, let's actually make sure that what we're producing and pushing out the door is going to be an an effective, reliable, good user experience, secure solution for the people using it, whether it's employees or customers. And throughout history, I mean, the, the history of IT has been develop, developers create something, throw it over the fence and say, ops, it's your job now. How do we, how do we overcome that issue? Yeah. So I think really this is the key question. I think you've 
hit on the, the core of it and why it, DevOps really exists. So imagine, you know, you're uh, one of these developers, the guys with the pizza in the Mountain Dew, and you're coding up your cool things. And then, like I said, you throw it over the wall. And in terms of how that operates in the real world, the security considerations, the reliability, the performance, that's somebody else. That's those nerds that have to deal with like servers and, you know, operating systems and whatnot. So let's say it breaks. Let's say it's not reliable. It gets hacked or doesn't have sufficient capacity or, you know, the million things that can go wrong to cause an incident or an outage or degradation in performance. Well, that's not your problem. But for the operations guys that get the call at three o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and they've got to deal with it and they've got to go through their documentation, the lack thereof or whatever, it's a real problem. And let's say it's a critical business function, like it's a bank or like a trading platform or something. And every minute that your key critical applications are down, it's costing you hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of dollars, and it's hurting your reputation. And from security perspective, let's say there's data breaches and things like that. Again, as a developer, maybe you don't really care because that's somebody else's problem. I coded it up. It worked fine on my laptop. But all of a sudden, if you're on a DevOps team and if your software breaks in the middle of the night or there's data breaches and there's you know all kinds of performance and financial things, you're held accountable just as much as the operations guys. That incentivizes you that when you write your code, you write it to be scalable. You put in error logs, and you make sure there's monitoring in place. You have things like self-healing type of capabilities. So if it detects an error, it fixes itself so that you don't get the call at three o'clock in the morning. And that thing you're saying, you know, designing for quality. And you know, we talked about security just a little bit. There's a new movement. It's not that new, but people are starting to embrace it. Not just DevOps, but DevSecOps, the sec being security. And the idea of having the operations guys, the security guys, the developers on collaborative teams that are building security reliability into the the services and the applications. So it's not just cool features and functions. Yeah, cool features and functions. And we got to get those out fast, but they have to be high quality and reliable. And that's a whole you know culture shift. And it's also a, a skills thing. I mean, not everyone has that. And getting different teams with different terminology and different ideas and different tools, and different perspectives to work together. You might have to hire differently and train differently and organize differently. So that question you asked before rolling about like, is this different? It is kind of a paradigm shift. It's harder to do, but it's not completely different because the things that you did back in the old ITIL IT service management days around incident management, problem management, capacity management, security, scalability, you know, thinking the user perspective, all the enterprise architecture, all that, those things that were well established way back in those ITIL days are just as relevant, if not more relevant than ever. So like I see more of an evolution versus like a complete paradigm shift. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun if I'm a cool developer <laughs> and now I yeah, get I signed up for waking mm -hmm. up at, at 3 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Well, yeah. thank you, Greg. That's that's a good suggestion. But yeah. I guess I guess our listeners' brains are, are starting to boil about all that definition <laughs> stuff and they're looking yeah. forward to, to hearing about how you do this in real life. But before we do this, we want to give you a little break and we just return after this. Did you know that over 51% of digital transformations fail? It's often due to culture challenges, communication issues, and one-off tech investments. But what if you could turn these hurdles into a growth opportunity? The LSA Digital Formula, developed from years of extensive experience, ensures sustainable transformations. This formula cultivates an agile culture for flexibility, streamlines operations with lean governance, and promotes collaborative digital processes. In addition, we roadmap the path to scalable tech investments with enterprise architecture and inject a secure user experience so people can actually use the technology. Paired with IT service management, this formula delivers effective business and IT services. Our start small scale up approach drives incremental team outcomes with leadership transparency, rapid feedback, and faster pivots. At LSA Digital, we don't just transform, we build lasting success. All right, guys, we're back for part two of this interview. We want to have a chat with Craig a little bit more about how we get some real examples around DevOps using tools, and then we'll talk a little bit about the hard things to do to make this actually work. All right, uh, so Craig, tell us, can you give us some examples? How does this work in real life? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, cause the first bit of the podcast, we were just talking about all these cool things you can do. A natural question after that is, well, how would I actually make this work in real life? And I think is was kind of 
suggest it's not necessarily that easy. So there's a couple things I'd suggest. I mean, first off, I think it's really helpful to have a holistic approach. If you try to go in there and just focus on the tools or just focus on hiring the right people, that is probably going to be insufficient. You want to look at people, process, technology, you know, the, the whole the whole gamut. Um, I think it's really good to look at industry frameworks. You, you don't have to be a zealot. You don't have to follow, say, the Eichel version four books to the letter. You don't have to follow everything it says in safe, scaled, agile. I think the idea of you want to adopt and adapt, and it's okay to combine things together is really, really important. But I would encourage people, I think, that you know, if you're not really sure about what the best practices are from an operations perspective, look at the ITIL books, look at the latest stuff, like ITIL version 4, the most recent, look at SAFE. Uh, in, in SAFE in particular, they have, uh, we'll talk about DevOps quite a bit, they have what's called a, the Calmer model, the uh, C-A-L-M uh, R, which is for culture, automation, lean flow, measurement, and recovery. And um, the idea here, that is a holistic approach. So it is, you really do want to look at automation as your, your tooling, but you also want to look at culture and measurement and you know how to make sure you're, what you're developing is in fact scalable and reliable and has all the appropriate uh, ability to withstand a continually changing environment. So I do think a lot of people focus on automation and I will talk about that one because I'm kind of a software tools guy, you know, so <laughs> I, I like that. And it's sometimes kind of the easiest thing is you can just like buy and install tools. Um, so from my perspective, one of the things I see as a huge problem is that you have, like I mentioned, the ops people or the infrastructure people and the developer people having entirely different tool sets that don't communicate with each other. For me, the, the classic pattern I see is you'll have on the development side, they're most of those folks are using things like Jira, and they're maybe using, say, Azure DevOps. That's a Microsoft competing tool that's referred to as ADO for short, Azure DevOps. And then maybe things like Jenkins and GitHub and whatever. And then on the operations side, they're going to have other tools, things that are probably like ServiceNow, for example, and a lot of monitoring tools, things like Splunk and whatnot. And then a lot of the cloud tools, you know, AWS and Azure and, and those type of things. And so you often have entirely different processes. You often have disconnected tools. And if you have to do that, throwing things over the wall, there's a lot of manual copying and pasting. And I think for the developers, they often feel like ServiceNow is the bane of their existence and it's just a bureaucratic obstacle and it's a waste of time. And for the operations people and the auditing and compliance people, like these developers are a bunch of cowboys and they don't follow process and they're creating security can, you know, issues and all kinds of things like that. And so integrating your tools is really helpful. And, it, you know, I think on that uh, visual role, in the, I think you're going to share, there's a million tools. I mean, there's literally like a thousand different tools you could put in your, your DevOps tool chain. And I would recommend not having a thousand tools. I don't think you need a thousand. You maybe only need just a small handful. So be strategic about the tools you pick and integrate those together. So for example, integrating, say, Jira, Jenkins, and ServiceNow would be a really great pattern. And these companies, they know that this is really critical. Uh, so they've built in a lot of plugins that you can you know, essentially very quickly get these integrated together. And when I say integrated, I don't mean just that like data flows back and forth, that they can bring in your, your orchestration patterns and your pipelines and your policies. And if you make a change on one side, it reflects those changes and policies on the other side. Uh, ServiceNow has something that's not all that new, but it's, you know, some people may not be aware of it. Even if you're an old time ServiceNow person who's familiar with incident management and change management and CMDB and things like that, you may not have heard something called the DevOps change velocity application. And this is designed to very, very quickly integrate ServiceNow, in particular, your change management processes and policies with all the industry standard tools. Jenkins, Azure DevOps, SonarCube, GitHub, GitLab, all, all, all of these things. And so if you do that, what you can have is your different people in different roles can use their tool of choice. You can be exclusively in Jenkins. And when you do something in Jenkins, all the things that you've done, all your test evidence, all your security considerations, all your features and functions, all the things that you need to do to ensure quality and speedy delivery – that's all reflected in ServiceNow and vice versa. If you raise something in ServiceNow, you'll be able to, you say, approve something in ServiceNow. The folks that are using Jenkins will see those approvals and have the permission to launch into production and be in compliance with audit security and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I would say of that calmer model, 
yeah, you got to get the culture right. You got to measure the right things. You got to have the right people, the right skills. You need all the governance and all that. But get the right tools and then integrate those. And then make sure that when you integrate them, that the the policies and processes you have make sense. That you don't have conflicting policies. They often say if you have a bad process and you automate a bad process, you get bad results really, really fast. So, you know, <laughs> try to have a good processes and then automate that and integrate that. And then you're likely to have the abilities that organizations like Google and Spotify and Facebook and, uh, you know, Amazon, where they're able to outcompete all the other companies that are in the same space. They move, f- often move faster. They're able to release to market more quickly. They have, uh, you know, very uh, often good quality, good reliability with lots of great features and functions, and they keep continue to stay ahead of the pack. Yeah, that sounds that when you said the bad policies, that reminded me of something that my son said the other day to me, where he said, "Oh, a bad driver never misses an exit." So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but hey, yeah. enough nerd nerdery nerdism. You know about tools and all that stuff. I think there's a little bit more that that we might have to to discuss because when I think about the do's and don'ts um, of, of uh, DevOps, you know, there were obviously other things, you know, like, as we said before, uh, flow, measurement, recovery. Can you talk a little bit about those things that are completely, well, not completely independent of the tools because you implement these, these features in the tools, but something that someone who sets up that tool chain has to think about? Yeah, that's a great question. I will tell you what I see very, very commonly is the, the scenario where I'm a development team and I've got a lot of automation. I've got these great orchestration pipelines. I've got automated regression testing, blue green environments. I'm able to migrate code from dev to test to QA to staging. And, mm-hmm. you know, at each uh, step along the way, it's doing this automatic regression testing and spitting out reports. And you can see that the things are functional and ready to go. And you're ready to press that button, you know, boop, let's release into production. And then you hit this big giant wall, which is often called uh, like the change management uh, function. So you mm-hmm. go, okay, I can't release into production. I've done all the ad test evidence. I know for a fact of all my automation and everything that's ready to go, but I've got to go into service now. I got to manually open up a ticket. I got to copy and paste in a bunch of stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. Very often, you know, like, okay, it needs approvals from people. And sometimes those can be very painful. Like people are approving via, you know, emails or through like Microsoft Teams chats or whatever. Uh, there's Wait, often there's another like, way to do this. Yeah, there are. Well, and then it gets what? worse though. They're, often there's say a change advisory board or sometimes it's called like a, you know, CCB. A <laughs> architecture review board. board or architecture CCB. review board. Or we talk about security. <laughs> Maybe there's some, some sort of security yeah. review. And so what'll commonly happen is, well, the, the, the CAD, the change advisory board, maybe it meets once a week. And if you're lucky, your change gets on the agenda and they'll discuss it. And until the change advisory board meets and approves it, you can't get it into production. And then maybe someone like on the you know, security team is like, mm, well, we haven't seen that yet. So we have a lot of questions for you. And then you got to kind of go back to stage one and prove to them. And you end up even though the, everything's ready and quite possibly using some automation where you actually have security tools in place and you know it's secure, but until the mm-hmm. security guys who are totally not part of that process. So, you know, we talked about a dev sec ops where security mm-hmm. is built and they often call, call the shifting left, you know, early in the life cycle, the security people are part of that development process and you're meeting their policies and standards and they feel confident that you have security built in, but they're, they're left to the end. They're, they're right at the very end, right before release. And so, you have to almost start over again. So between the change advisory board, the the auditing people, the compliance people, the security people, even though this the software was ready to be released today, it could be weeks, maybe months, who knows, before it actually goes into production. And you can imagine from a business perspective, something that you want to get to your customers today that gets delayed by months when your competitors are moving at speed, uh, you're, you're, you're not going to do very well in the marketplace if, if you continue to follow that pattern. Which is very interesting because I see that on the on the business side as well. You know, the the risk people, the control people. You know, they, for whatever reason, people have that perception that they are the showstoppers. You know, and they are the bad guys. And and no, let's not talk to them, right? Mm. And and then they come in, as you said, at the very end, and then they are obviously not amused. You know, being not <laughs> yeah. being not involved early, right? So, yeah, if if right. one of the tips, so so if I could pick your brain as as one of the last questions, 
Um, can you give us your your do's and don'ts? And I'm pretty sure one of the first do's is involve your secure, security guys yeah. and risk guys very early. But what are what are other tips or do's and don'ts that you can uh, share with our audience? Yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot. That's why the the ITIL books are like thousands of pages long. Okay, keep it, like keep, it so, keep it to three. Keep it to three. Yeah, so I, I, you know, so I'll just pick like a couple, like, like off the top of my head, that are some big ones. Um, like, I would say that. The short line, you know, if someone said summarize what IT service management is in a sentence, it's to try to align business with IT, which I know is really mm -hmm. vague, but there's this often is forgotten. I mean, if you're a technology person or developer, a lot of times you're just doing stuff that's cool. I just like, why, why did we do it this way? Well, you know, we could, which is not a very good reason. So, you know, if you have things like the safe framework, you've got Uh, you know, lean portfolio management. There, there's things you can put in place where the business works collaboratively with your technology folks to make sure you're prioritizing the right things, you're setting realistic timelines, that you're involving all the right people. And that's the idea of a DevOps team is that you have user experience people, you have back-end developers, you have security people, you have people from representing the business who are working as a team to make sure that you're building the right things, the right priority, and releasing in a way that makes sense from a business perspective that balances features and functions with risk. So uh, a lot of this is like a culture and a governance kind of thing. It's not really technology, but to do that, you also have to hire the right people. If you hire people mm -hmm. that don't have that mentality and don't have that, have those skills, you're going to have a hard time executing something like this. So I think sometimes foundationally it's that you have to uh, be recruiting the right kind of people and you have to be the kind of place that those type of people want to work at. You know, if you're say smart enough to work at Google and whatever, you've got these great skills, but you don't pay very, your organization doesn't pay very well and you don't treat people very well and you don't really have a DevOps kind of in culture that empowers people to be their best. They're going to go somewhere else. Right. So this is where I think a lot of organizations really struggle is, you know, they just, they're not set up for DevOps because they're very mm -hmm. command and control. They're very hierarchical. They don't really embrace change. They're very risk averse. And I understand why I'd say if you're like a bank or something like that, of course you need to be risk averse. Like insurance people are, you know, very conservative by nature for a good reason, but you have to balance that. If you're so conservative and you're so risk averse and you say hire and set up your culture and your governance in such a way that the developers feel uh, handcuffed, And, you, and, you, and a lot of times organizations, they create these organizational silos. They set it up so people have adversary relationships. They have different managers. They have different, they report yeah. to different people. They have different financial incentives. They, they're, they're measured in different ways. And so people don't like each other. They don't want to talk to each other. So even an organization like that with lots of silos that doesn't encourage collaboration, you're going to have yeah, a yeah. really, really hard time executing a DevOps strategy. So I know that's, Like what's I, what yeah. you do? It's not easy to do this. All these things are hard, but if you don't get that part right, you're gonna have a hard time with all the best tools in the world. It's probably not going to work all that well. Yeah, I was I was actually working I don't know 20, 25 years ago at a large project with one of the big German telcos. You know where we remodernized their finance systems, and they literally called the different groups they called themselves. Yeah, so, you know, so yeah, it's like, like, a, prison. It's like, a, prison. like a prison cell. Yeah, yeah, it's like right, a prison, yeah. you know? Oh, yeah. 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 So they didn't talk to each other. That was that was interesting. It was good for the company because we we built a lot, you know, because of that dysfunctionality. <laughs> But still, you know, you don't want yeah. to work in a cell yeah. and go to that project for three years, you know? Well, we're, we're getting to the end, Greg. Um, thanks for that very, very interesting and entertaining <laughs> introduction into DevOps. I, I know we could have spoken another three hours and more yeah. about this. Yes. Uh, yeah. I also know that there's a book that you recommend, you know, about ITIL and DevOps that we will put in the show yeah. notes. But there's maybe maybe some things, if I was a listener, and, and luckily I do have your email address, but uh, how can, how oh, can people... Yeah. 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 How can people reach out to you? How, what, what is, you know, what's going on in your mind right now? And, and what could you give as a recommendation to our yeah, dear listeners? Yeah. So uh, in terms of things to say reference before about how to contact mm -hmm. me, I want to answer that question first. Uh, a lot of people understandably might be intimidated by getting like, say the ITIL books, they're kind of dry, they're expensive. It's, it's, you know, it's not good fun summer reading. If you go to, say, the SAFE, the Scale Agile website, there's just voluminous documentation there. Again, this might be kind of hard to get through. And, you know, if you want to go get certifications, it can be a bit of a road to, like, learn everything you need to know to be a, you know, an ITIL 
scaled agile certified person that has all that information. Uh, so what I recommend a good place to start is there's a book that I like called the Phoenix project by Gene Kim. Now I don't get mm-hmm. any the royalties for this at all. It's just, I personally am a fan of this book and it basically, it's like a novel. It's a story that talks about a company. It's a fictional company going through their DevOps journey. And by the end of this book, you'll have a pretty good idea like what DevOps is and the challenges you face and how to overcome those challenges. And it's not very technical and it's, it is quite entertaining. So that, that's a good one. I, I do recommend the Phoenix project quite a bit. Uh, they have an audio book. So, you know, if it's the kind of thing you can like listen to while you're waiting in line at the bank or in the car or something like that. Um, and there's also a lot of great stuff on YouTube. You know, again, I don't get paid by Google or anything like that, but if you go to YouTube, there's tons of stuff that are about ServiceNow, ITIL, DevOps, and sometimes there's these, you know, 20 minute videos, the short introduction, the LSA website that we, we all work for LSA digital. We have a ton of great resources, free resources, short videos, longer videos, case studies and things that are available on our website. Uh, something that I would point people to, if you're really interested in IT service management and DevOps, um, we have a, a free ITSM maturity self-assessment. You, you go there. So on our, our LSA digital website, uh, there's a thing called free resources. One of them is the ITSM self-assessment. If you go in there, it's short. In about five minutes, you can do the assessment. You'll get an idea of compared to others in the industry, how you rank, basically. You'll identify maybe some gaps and areas for improvement. It gives you a, a quick report. And then uh, it gives you the opportunity to schedule time with me. You, you uh, Yay. yeah, you, you can get a, a free hour consultation to discuss your results and all the things we talked about today. If anything interests you, you have the option to do a deep dive on that topic. And so I just encourage people, if you want to reach out to me, that's probably the best way to do it. And I, and I really, I hope people do, because I'm very passionate. As you can probably tell I'm passionate about this topic and love to help people with these kind of issues. Cause I do think it's, it's really, uh, really makes a difference. It'll, it'll make you uh, more competitive in the industry if you follow some of these best practices. Of course. And then you, you obviously have a LinkedIn. So I'm going to put your LinkedIn information there as I, well. Yeah, I'm, I'm, Even I'm, though I, yeah. I do recommend doing that self-assessment, you know, to get a little bit of context before before you chat. Um, yeah. Well, but anyways, Greg, so um, we're, we're definitely over our self-imposed limit of half an hour. Um, thank you for being a guest on our show. Um, My pleasure. I'm looking forward to more conversations with you about this and, and more nerdiness in, in these things. <laughs> I'm a bottomless um, pit of nerdiness. So if you want to <laughs> talk about barbecue or sci-fi or something business related, I, 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 I'm happy to talk about any topic you're interested in. Wonderful. Wonderful. And, and now, uh, dear audience, well, thank you for <laughs> listening and, and watching to our shenanigans over here. Um, obviously, there's more to come. So stay tuned. But for now, I'd like to thank you and I wish you a great day.